My name is Shane. Welcome to Bible Bites. The title of this video is Proof. You know, our country, uh, the legal system, is founded upon a very simple yet profound truth. People are presumed innocent until proven guilty. And this topic is kind of like that, in that I say Christians do not need to prove that God exists. Rather, atheists need to prove that he doesn't. So we assume right off the bat that God is, that he exists, and, and that he is the creator of all things. Now, why do I say that atheists need to prove that he doesn't exist? Well, I don't think that Christians should be on the defensive, uh, having to prove what they believe, because uh, it is by faith that we believe, uh, based on the truth that God, through the Holy Spirit, reveals to us. And so we don't need to prove it. We believe it because that truth has been revealed to us. So those who don't believe, they need to provide proof for why they don't believe what is there. Okay, and what is my basis for all of this? Well, I want to show you uh, two different passages, one in the Psalms and one in Romans. So the, the first one is Psalms 19, verses 1 through 2. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So the heavens declare that God is the splendor of his works. And day by day, every day as you uh, go throughout your day, and night by night, all through the night as you look around, Nature itself reveals that God is. All right, and let's take a look at Romans chapter 1. Uh, I want to begin with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, this verse is telling us that God is going to pour forth his wrath. He's going to judge sinners because of their sin, because they haven't turned to him and repented. And uh, the reason that they rebel and that they sin and turn away from God is because of their ungodliness and their unrighteousness and in their unrighteousness, they are suppressing the truth of God. They suppress that. They, they can't prove that God doesn't exist, so they justify um, having their life, their existence, separated from God. They have to justify that. And in, the best way to do that, to justify living the way they want to live, is to say that God doesn't exist. But saying he doesn't exist doesn't make it so. He does exist. The heavens declare that he exists. Nature declares that he exists. Now let's take a look at the next two verses here in Romans chapter 1. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So if that passage in Psalms 19 verses 1 and 2 wasn't sufficient enough to convince you, these words are, nature proves that God exists. The work of God's hand in all throughout all of his creation proves that God exists, that they were created by someone and put in a, uh, a divine order. This system of life and the world uh, 
is phenomenal. It's not possible for it to have happened by chance. Life, existence, did not happen by chance. It had to have been created. There was a beginning. The uh, matter itself did not just um, always exist. Matter itself is not eternal. It had to be created. It had to come from somewhere. And that somewhere, that source, is God. And all of nature, day and night, continue to provide proof, evidence, unrefutable, that God exists. And because of that, it is evident within the creature, the human being, within the human being who has been created, it is evident within us, based on that proof, that God exists. And therefore, as verse 20 says, we are without excuse. We are without excuse because the evidence is there right before us. Now, I want to take a look at the next three verses in Romans chapter 1. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. How amazing is that? See here again, the unrighteousness of man, the ungodliness of man, wanting to continue to live in unrighteousness, to live according to our own ways, we have chosen to deny the evidence that's in nature, the evidence that's even within us that proves that God exists, and therefore we need to honor him and give thanks to him and to fear him and to uh, follow his ways, his directions for how we should live in life, we choose to deny him, to reject him, so that we can live the way we want to live. And it's just, it's illogical. And the propositions that atheists uh, come up with, uh, saying that God doesn't exist, is also illogical. It is proof positive through nature itself, that God exists. And what happens then in that rejection of, of God and uh, recognizing him and giving thanks to him for being God, the creator of all things and uh, the ruler of all things, uh, in rejecting him, something has to take its place. And man has decided that man shall take his place. And so that's what it means by here exchanging the glory of, an incor of the incorruptible God and his divine power. We've exchanged that for the glory of man. That man is now the supreme being with our reason and intellect. And uh, what we perceive of the existence of life and how the systems fit together and work, we have decided that we know best and we reject God. Let me uh, finish with uh, two more verses out of Romans uh, 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Where'd that lie come from? It came from with our own ungodly unrighteous hearts 
that we decided to reject God and come up with our own truth. Man. And so instead of worshiping and glorifying God, we decide to worship and glorify the reason of man. But because the proof is irrefutable in all of creation itself, that God does exist, and now that we see here that denying that, rejecting that, um, is in itself unrighteousness, it is sin, what do we do? What, what should we do now? Well, there's three more passages that I want to take a look at that show what our response should be when we finally recognize the error of our way, that we are being sinful and unrighteous, and we want to turn back to God um, because of what we just saw in Psalms uh, 19, 1 and 2, and Romans 1, uh, 18 through 25. What do we do then once we recognize the truth? Well, first I want to take a look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 39 and 40. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. There is no complaint that we can come up with. There is no justification for our sin and our unrighteousness. There's, there, it makes no sense to complain about it. We have it. We need to own up to it, acknowledge it, and accept the fact that we are sinners. And then, based on that introspection, that probing our own hearts and our, and our way of life, we come to the conclusion that, yes, indeed, we are sinners. We accept it, we acknowledge it, but we want to do better. We want to uh, turn away from sin. So what do we do? Well, this passage tells us, return to the Lord. Turn back to God. And let's take a look now at Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. So God himself tells us, once you have probed your ways, examined uh, your way of life and your thinking, and realize that you are sinning, then God himself declares, return to me. I I'm full of grace and compassion, and I'm slow to anger. He wants to forgive us. How remarkable is that? Even in the depth of our sin, even in the depth of our utter rejection of God, once we realize that we are wrong and that God is there, we see that he's there with open, loving arms saying, come to me, come back to me and I will forgive you. Repent of your ways and return to me. Last passage is in Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Kind of wraps it all up and uh, sums everything very nicely. So Isaiah 55, uh, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, 
nor are my are your ways my ways declares the lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways in my thoughts than your thoughts i love how this uh, streams this together and it ties everything that we've talked about so far uh, together in just this one passage and the way it puts it here is uh, you know return to the Lord return to the Lord and in and, and here how it says uh, God says my thoughts are not your thoughts see you are thinking that uh, in your reason and in your logic that God doesn't exist you are thinking uh, and reasoning according to your logic that you are wise and smarter than anything else, that you can figure it out and put it all together and then live according uh, uh, to what you think and how you feel. But your thoughts are not my thoughts, God says. Your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. He says this multiple times in this short passage. Um, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways and your thoughts are evil. They're ungodly. They're unrighteous. Uh, they they cause you to reject me and elevate yourself and and worship and honor the reason of humanity. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And then he ends by saying, uh, because my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Nature declares that God exists. And anything that we can reason out in order to live our way of life is wrong. We need to accept that God exists. Nature proves that, gives irrefutable evidence of that. So we just need to acknowledge it, accept it, that we are sinners, and return to the Lord. And he will forgive us. So, as I began, let me finish by saying, Christians, believers, we do not need to prove that God exists. Atheists, however, need to engage in a very stringent exercise of trying to prove that God doesn't exist. Nature itself proves that he does. So I hope that this helps you shore up your faith, that it gives you a different perspective on how you testify about Jesus with others around you. Let them try and prove that he doesn't exist. Our job is simply to agree with God in what he says in his word and to let others know that we agree with what God says in his word and to invite them to come see Jesus for themselves. Invite them to church. Invite them to a Bible study. Invite them to uh, some event being hosted and put on by the church. Invite people to come see Jesus for themselves. And then they will see. They will learn what the truth really is. And hopefully bend their knee and confess with their tongue that Jesus is does exist, that God exists, and that Jesus for, provides the only way that we can be forgiven from our sin. So until our next video, I pray that God blesses you, that he keeps you, and that he gives you his peace.